In this video, I'm going to be working through the notes on logical arguments. You could also think of this as validity of arguments. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, laws of um, validity for arguments. We're going to talk about fallacies for particular arguments. We're going to use Euler diagrams to demonstrate um, particular arguments. Um, and we are going to uh, wrap up with using um, particular fallacies to discern whether or not arguments are valid or invalid. That is going to be in a separate video. Um, some of those fallacies are going to be very familiar to most of you. So first, let's talk about validity. We say that an argument is valid if the conclusion necessarily follows from the premises. So let's consider this first argument here. We're saying that all college professors have at least a master's degree. So from here, I see a universal quantifier. So I'm thinking, okay, well, here's all of my college professors. This is going to be contained in the universe of people with at least a master's degree. Now we've got Dr. Jones is a college professor. So there's Dr. Jones. Therefore, Dr. Jones has at least a master's degree. So what we're saying is Dr. Jones, since, is, since Dr. Jones is in the professor universe, they necessarily are in the universe of people with at least a master's degree. Now, for those of you who have um, a little bit of a knowledge of higher ed, um, we actually can discern that this person at least has a master's degree because we are calling them doctor. Um, so there's that. So the way that we think of an argument is it's a set of premises and a conclusion. So here are our premises. We're given the information that all college professors have at least a master's degree, and we're given the information that Dr. Jones is a college professor. So then the question becomes, from here, do we necessarily have the information to say, okay, well, this conclusion naturally follows. That's when we're discussing the validity of an argument. Now, there's all kinds of different ways that an argument can be uh, valid or invalid. But when we, well, there's all kinds of ways that an argument can be valid, and we're going to talk about some of those. When the conclusion doesn't necessarily follow from the premises, we call this invalid argument. Okay. Now, an error in reasoning that results in an invalid argument is called a fallacy. Now, these, um, this term fallacy probably isn't shocking to you. So unless I've heard the particular fallacies that have names, uh, the most popular of which unfortunately is ad hominem. Uh, we have red herring, uh, we've got correlation causation, we've got all kinds of different um, fallacious types of arguments. Um, and we have given some of those particular fallacies names, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start by talking about the ways that we can sculpt a valid argument. Something I really wanna drive home here, whoop, it's not that. So something I really want to drive home here <coughs> is that validity of an argument does not necessarily mean that you agree with it. It also doesn't necessarily mean that you think it makes sense. It also doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. What validity means is that the argument is consistent in its philosophy. So there's a lot of things that you may disagree with that may be patently false, that may not make any sense to us whatsoever, that are absolutely valid arguments. So be very careful with this idea that validity is philosophically the end-all, be-all of an argument. It's not that difficult to sculpt a valid argument. And if we're using premises that are particularly false, there's all kinds of things we can say that are not true, that are absolutely valid. So when you hear folks argue, and you hear someone say, actually, that argument isn't technically valid because, and they'll say something about how a premise is false. Well, that's not necessarily true. That's not necessarily what makes the argument invalid. The argument can still be valid. It can just be, a, it can just be patently false. So keep that in mind when we're going through this. When I'm saying an argument's invalid, I'm not saying I disagree. I'm not saying I think it's wrong. I'm saying that it's not philosophically consistent and that the conclusion doesn't necessarily follow from the premises. So first, if the battery is dead, we'll call that statement P. 
the cell film will not work. That's Q. I'm given P, this is my premise, therefore the cell film will not work, Q. This satisfies what's called the law of detachment. What I'm saying is, uh, given the hypothesis, the conclusion necessarily follows. Okay, so we're given the hypothesis, the conclusion necessarily follows. This makes a ton of sense um, when we think about our conditional statements, okay? This makes a ton of sense when we think about those. Law of contraposition. As a note, remember that the statement if P then Q is absolutely equivalent, logically equivalent to the statement if not Q, then not P. So if I make the statement, if I practice, then I will improve, we'll call, if I practice, we'll call that P, then I will improve, we'll call that Q. If I did not improve, well, I'm given not Q, therefore I did not practice. Yeah, that's absolutely valid. What we're talking about here is the law of detachment with the contraposition. We already know that a statement's contrapositive is logically equivalent to the, the original statement. So it necessarily follows that if the law of detachment is true, then certainly the law of contraposition has to be true. Because if, if the statement is the same as its contraposition, as its contrapositive, then certainly if I'm given one of the con, if I'm given the um, hypothesis of the contrapositive, I necessarily have the conclusion of the contrapositive. All right, law of syllogism. So the way I think of the law of syllogism is, man, I really wanna get from P to R, but I may have to be making a little bit of a jump along the way. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring the audience to Q with me and then take them from Q to R. Maybe going straight from P to R, maybe you can't tap directly into the vein there, but we could use something along the way to help us get there. So think about this argument we've set up here. If you text while driving, we'll call this P. Then you are driving distracted. We'll call this Q. This is difficult to argue with. Now, if I drive distracted, if I'm giving Q, then you are endangering others. We'll call endangering others R. So I'm given if P then Q, if Q then R, then now what naturally follows from here is if you text while driving, if P, then you are endangering others, then R. This is totally agreeable. There's nothing wrong with this. Think of this as a stop along the way. From P, to R. Maybe going straight from P to R would seem really disagreeable to folks. So what I'm going to do is just go ahead and put Q in that place to kind of help us sort of arrive there. So we're taking a stop along the way. Now the law of disjunctive syllogism. This one, this state, this type of, um, this type of statement we use really often. And this is a perfect example from any advising appointment I would have. So Natalie's going to take either chemistry or biology as a required lab science. Since Natalie did not take chemistry, therefore Natalie has to take biology. So you can think of these as one of two possibilities. I'm saying if P or Q, well then not P in this case, why not? Therefore Q. Ultimately, what's happening is I've got a choice, right? And I have to do one or the other. So really what we're saying is with disjunctive syllogism, 
disjunction. So disjunction means or. Keep that in mind. Okay, so we're the, the real thing to keep in mind here is the disjunctive part of the syllogism. Okay. So what we're we're really going to drive home here is due to the nature of all or if P or Q, then at least one of P or Q. So if I said not P, then I have to have Q. And if I said not Q, then I have to have P. If you hear that sound in the background, that's my son going down for a nap. Um, he's obviously doing a great job. Now, let's talk about fallacies. So there's a lot of ways that an argument can be valid. There's also a lot of ways an argument can be invalid. Here's some of the most popular ones. So the fallacy of the converse. So keep in mind that if I've got a statement, it is not logically equivalent with its converse. They're absolutely not the same thing, right? And we saw this in the case of, you know, can you be a student at John Tyler and in this course, right? We saw that the converse absolutely did not work with those types of statements. We saw that the converse was logically equivalent to the inverse, which is fine, but the converse and the inverse were not logically equivalent with the original statement. So yeah, we had to be cognizant of that. In the same vein, you have to be cognizant here, okay? If a statement, we'll say conditional, is true, it's converse, may not necessarily be true. Now, when I talk about true here, what I'm not saying is correct or incorrect. What I'm saying is that um, for validity to take place, there has to be this kind of natural progression from um, premise to conclusion. If there's a natural, uh, progression from premise to conclusion, that doesn't necessarily mean that there is a natural progression from conclusion to premise. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's impossible, but to say that it has to be the case, that is a fallacy. That is fallacious thinking. That is untrue. So this is a perfect example of this. The battery is dead. We'll call that P. The car won't start Q. The car won't start, so we're given Q. Therefore, the battery is dead. That doesn't make sense. There's all kinds of different ways a car can not start. Some of us have, ex have explored all of these different avenues with our cars, whether that be um, out of gas, right? that's absolutely happened to me. Um, it could be uh, alternator, right? There could be no compression. You, if you've got a super duper old car, there could just be something going on with the carburetor. Man, there's all kinds of stuff that could go wrong with a car. Again, some of us have quite a bit of experience with that. Fallacy of the inverse, same type of thing here. If I'm given the statement, if P then Q, that is not logically equivalent with if not P, then not Q. I'm not saying that's always the case. Certainly there are some statements where um, the statement is true and its inverse is necessary is true as well. But to say that because the statement is true, that the inverse necessarily has to be true, that's fallacious thinking. You cannot expect that. Okay. So I'm going to use the same type of reasoning here. If a statement is true, its inverse need not Again, I'm not saying it's impossible that it's true. I'm saying it doesn't need to be true. Okay, there's no guarantee that it would be. So I'm given here, if P then Q, I'm given if not P, can I suppose not Q? Well, if I exercise, then I will lose weight. 
Well, I did not exercise, therefore I did not lose weight. That's not true. I could also have gone on a diet. There's all kinds of other of ways to lose weight. Okay. Now, this is a weird one. Fallacy of the inclusive or. So inclusive or, when we talk about or, what we grant when we use the word or is that at least one of the statements are true. Okay, now let's look at, let's explore what's happening here. So Jason is gonna take psychology or sociology. We'll say P or Q. We're saying P. Therefore, Jason did not take sociology. Do we necessarily know that that's the case? We actually don't know that. This is a fallacious argument. And this is the tricky one. This is a really kind of weird one to think about. Like, what is the difference between Jason, in this example, what's the difference between Jason and Natalie? Well, here's the thing that makes it different. Natalie has to take a lab science. Jason is just taking courses. So in the grand scheme of things, it's really important that we understand the difference between these things. Okay, so with the fallacy of the inclusive or, you could always think of why, well, hold on, let me write this like a normal person. Why not both? You know, Jason took psychology, he's, he's got to take psychology or sociology. He took psychology. That does not necessarily mean that he did not take sociology. Now, if we said he didn't take psychology, that does necessarily mean that he has to take sociology. So really, when you think about the fallacy of the inclusive or, you could always ask yourself that question, why not both, right? Now, there's ways that we can evaluate deductive arguments. So we've talked about um, laws, that, uh, laws of validity. We've talked about fallacies. We're not done with fallacies. We're gonna revisit those um, in the next video where we talk about fallacies that are so popular that we gave them names. Now we're gonna talk about ways to uh, come up with to, uh, ways to evaluate a deductive argument. So a deductive argument, and we're using an Euler diagram to do this, okay? A deductive argument is considered valid if all the premises are true and the conclusion follows logically from those premises. In other words, the premises are true and the conclusion follows necessarily from those premises. So the argument that all cats are mammals and a tiger is a cat, so a tiger is a manimal, manimal is a mammal, is a valid deductive argument. So let's work back from the beginning of this. So I'm saying, all cats are mammals. So let's start with mammals. So here's my universe of mammals. I'm saying all cats are mammals. So cats are properly contained in this universe. Now I'm saying a tiger is a cat. Okay, so tigers are properly contained in cats. So now let's choose a particular tiger. Boop, this one here. Now the question is, is a tiger a mammal? Well, if I put a tiger, if I put this particular tiger in this universe, does the tiger have to be contained in this mammal universe? Certainly, of course it does, okay? Now, not all of them are gonna be that straightforward. So these are Venn diagrams. We also call them Euler diagrams. So another way you can see these is Euler diagrams. I understand that looks like it says Euler, but it doesn't, it says Euler. So here's a perfect example of when things don't work out. So we start with all firefighters, no CPR. So here's our universe of people who know CPR. And we're saying, okay, well, firefighters are perfectly contained in this universe. All right, great. Let me make that look like an actual thing. So here's my firefighters, okay? Now, what we're saying is, okay, all firefighters know CPR, and now I'm saying Jill knows CPR. So Jill, let's suppose we put Jill here. 
Sure, she knows CPR. But is it necessarily true that she has to be there? Could we put Jill here? Well, she does know CPR, but in this particular case, we see that she doesn't have to be a firefighter. So here's the thing. Is it possible that Jill is a firefighter? Certainly, but based on the information we were given, is it necessarily true that she has to be a firefighter? The answer to that is no. There's all kinds of folks who know CPR that are not firefighters. I am one of them, right? As a, so I used to teach high school, and as a high school teacher, I had to learn CPR. So I had to take a class on CPR. I am not a firefighter, so there you go. The conclusion does not necessarily follow from the premises. This is an invalid argument, regardless of whether or not Jill is actually a firefighter. The ends do not justify the means. Just because you may have happened to be right, that does not mean that your argument was valid. And that's not, this. Is, I, I hear this type of um, thinking all over the place where you know, well, it doesn't matter if you actually know what you're doing or not. If it's a true or false test, you just guess right. And you, if you guessed it right, then you obviously know it. No, that's not true. This notion of luck doesn't work with arguments as well. Just because you said something that's true doesn't mean that your argument was valid. So even if Jill is a firefighter, this argument is still invalid. Now, Let's determine the validity of this argument. Pause the video and try this on your own first. Okay, so here's what we've got. No cows are purple. So let me go ahead and do my purple universe here. Here's everything that is purple. Cool, and we're saying no cows are purple. So here's my universe of cows they are not gonna interact with one another because there's no cows that are purple. So there's no intersection there. These are what we call disjointed sets, if you remember. Okay. Now I'm saying Fido is not a cow. So if I'm not a cow, what that means is there's all kinds of different places I could be. So let's put Fido here. Can I put Fido here? Fide, who's that? So let's say I put Fido here. Am I allowed to do that? Well, it's not a, Fido is not a cow, so Fido can't be in that space. So since Fido is not in that space, we're okay. But does that necessarily mean that Fido has to be in the purple space? Certainly not. So I don't know why I erased that. That was dumb. So Fido is not in the purple space. It's not in here and it's not in here, which is legal. Our statement is absolutely fundamentally true in this case. So no, this statement is, this argument is invalid. It's an invalid argument. Okay. Now, take a minute and do a, do, these statements here, make your Venn diagrams for this, pause the video, try this on your own. All right, so first we're going to start with all cats per. So here's our cats. Here's the universe of our cats. And here's the universe of all animals that per. Boom. This is going to be what our Euler, Euler diagram would look like because we're saying all cats. That means perfect containment of the cats in the things that purr. Okay. Some JTC, blah, 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 blah. some JTCC students work full time. So when I see some, that's going to tell me that there's an intersection here. And so here, what I would say is JTCC students. Okay, that's gonna be who's in this space. And then over here are folks who are full-time. And I'm saying some. So the folks who are in here, yeah, nothing wrong with that. All right. 
some teachers are not in a union. So when I see some, well, I'm thinking, okay, well, here's the folks who are in a union. And then here are my teachers. So some teachers are not in a union. Can I identify in this space teachers who aren't in unions? Yep, here's one here. There's another one here. There's another one here. There's another one here. These are teachers that are not in unions, and that's some of them. That's true. Now, fun fact about unions. We don't have teachers unions in the state of Virginia. So anybody who's in the who's in this space, this person might work in Virginia. This person here might work in a state that is unionized, like Delaware or Jersey. Um, but they may not necessarily be in a union. What about folks in this space? Well, these are folks who are in a union that aren't teachers. These are folks who could be steel workers, um, automotive, uh, manufacturing, whatever the case may be. You could have folks who are in a union that are not teachers. Okay. No candy is considered a healthy food. Tragically, it's true. So here's my healthy food universe. Candy is going to have nothing to do with it. Here's all of my candy, right? Anything that's a candy is not a healthy food and vice versa, okay? If it's healthy food, it's definitely not candy. That statement's more agreeable to me. Now, here's what you're gonna do for these next bunches of statements. You are going to determine the validity of these arguments um, using either fallacies or um, laws of validity, or you can use Euler diagrams, whatever the case may be. Um, what I would do, let's kind of break this up into halves. So let's do A through F first. Go ahead and pause the video. And you don't just tell me whether the argument's valid or invalid. If it's valid and it uses a law, state the law. If the argument is invalid and it's fallacious, state the fallacy. If you use an Euler diagram, uh, draw the Euler diagram. You need to show work for this. All right, go ahead and pause the video and try these for me. Okay, so this first one's actually probably one of the trickier ones. We're saying all models are beautiful. So here's our universe of beautiful people. Within that universe, we've got our models. Now, what I'm saying here is some models are tall. So now, what I'm going to do is not pay any mind to the beautiful people, but I'm saying some models. When I say some, that means there's going to be an intersection. So let's say there's tall people here. There's going to be an intersection between tall people and models. Now, therefore, some beautiful people are tall. So just by looking at this, is it true that some beautiful people are tall? Well, just by looking at this statement, it's tempting to say that this is actually valid, but check this out. Some beautiful people are tall. So if I chose a beautiful person, boom, can you be beautiful and not be tall? Yeah, certainly. There's nothing against that. Uh, so this is where things get a little dicey. You'd be led to believe that this argument's valid, but let's draw another Euler diagram. And let's not be so friendly here. So certainly, all models are beautiful people, no problem. Now let's consider this statement. Some models are tall. Let's say the tall universe goes all the way out here. Hmm. OK. So we're saying some models are tall. There's that intersection. But this tall people uni uh, universe jumps outside of the beautiful people. OK, well, let's see if that's a big deal. Some beautiful people are tall. Hmm, well, is that necessarily true? Well, if I look at this, if I look at the beautiful people here, and I look at the tall people here, are there some beautiful people who are tall? Sure. No question about it. 
there absolutely are some beautiful people that are tall. Now, are there some tall people that are beautiful? Certainly. And are there tall people who aren't beautiful? Fine, yeah. This is a valid argument. And having your Euler diagrams are going to be the thing that proves that. Okay, so make sure that you include that. If you can't go to the movie, or if I can't go to the movie, then I'll go to the park. So what I'm going to do for this one is I'm going to use um, uh, symbolic logic. If I can't go to the movie, I'm going to say if not, that's not P, then I'll go to the park. That's Q. So that's what I'm given. My premise, if I can't go, if I can go to the movie, so then that's going to be P. Therefore, not Q. Well, hold on. This doesn't seem right. Because what I have here, I was given P, then not Q. Look at this statement. Look at this statement, if not P, then not Q. It's inverse. is if P, then not Q. Uh-oh, I was given P, I'm stating not Q. This statement is absolute, or this argument is invalid. And the reason it's invalid is we're looking at a fallacy of the inverse. Okay, P is absolutely invalid. All right, now let's talk about Julia. She's going to move to either California, we'll call this statement C, or Florida, that's F. We're saying that she did not move to Florida, therefore, so our premise is that she didn't move to Florida, therefore she moved to California. This statement is absolutely, or this argument is absolutely valid. If we look at this, if we look at the structure of this, what we're looking at here is the law of disjunctive syllogism. You would do well to write these laws down on note cards and have them available to you at first, okay? Just while you learn the vocabulary. You will need to have them memorized, okay? If you score at least a 90%, then you'll earn an A. You did not earn an A, therefore you did not score at least 90%. Well, let's see. So let's do this statement here. If I score at least 90%, we'll call that P. Then you'll earn an A, that's Q. If I did not earn an A, so I'm given not Q, I did not score at least 90%, therefore not P. Hmm, if I look at this, it's almost like I took the statement and I was given it's contrapositive. This is a valid argument. This is the law of contraposition. Okay. Some ARPs are bumps. Oh boy. So, some ARPs are bumps. So here's my bumps. Here are my ARPs, some of them. All bumps are certs. All right, so now what happens is I've got to make my cert universe contain all of the bumps. And I can try and do this as sneaky as I want, but I've got to do it. Therefore, some ARPs are SERPs. I'll give you an opportunity to draw a few more Euler diagrams to see if you can make this argument invalid. You'll see relatively quickly. It's not going to work. If you're going to draw the SERPs universe that contains all the bumps, you're going to have to touch A. And when you do that, that means that some ARPs now have to be SERPs. All right, now I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna give you a second to do F through K. Go ahead and pause the video and then work on that one. All right, so Jada is gonna play soccer or softball. So Jada is gonna play soccer, we'll call this O, or softball, we'll call this F, O or F. Jada plays soccer. Uh, that was our O. Therefore, Jada does not play softball. 
This argument is invalid. Again, a fair question. Why not both? This is the fallacy of the inclusive or. This argument is absolutely invalid. All equilateral triangles are equiangular. All equiangular triangles are isosceles. Therefore, all isosceles triangulars, triangles are equilateral. Woof. Okay. So, equilateral triangles. Um, how do we do this one? We'll say equilateral triangles are equiangular. Okay. So, then that's going to be our A. And all equiangular triangles are isosceles. Therefore, all isosceles triangles are equilateral. Well, no. There's all kinds of triangles which are isosceles, which are not equilateral. This is an invalid statement. Now, or invalid argument. So if I had switched this around, if I said all equilateral triangles are isosceles, totally, totally valid. But as of now, it is invalid. If you work hard, then you will succeed. If P then Q, you work hard P, therefore Q, absolutely. This is a valid argument. And this is valid because of the law of detachment. Okay. Law of detachment. No candy is considered a healthy food. As if I don't already know this. So we've got candy. We've got healthy food. Ice cream is not candy. Therefore, ice cream is healthy food. Can I put ice cream here? Is ice cream it's not candy, certainly not candy, but can I keep it away from the healthy food universe? Yeah, absolutely. This argument is invalid. There's a lot of things in the universe between candy and healthy food. Okay. All right. This thing up and out of the way. All right. Now, if we drive recklessly, we'll get into an accident. Okay, so we'll call this statement, uh, if you drive recklessly, we'll call that R. Then you will get into an accident, then A, that's our accident. You got into an accident, therefore you drove recklessly. This is invalid. This is the fallacy of the converse. Just because I'm given the conclusion, that doesn't necessarily mean that the hypothesis has to follow. There's all kinds of other ways I can get into accidents. Some of us have also explored all of those. If you take math, you will have strong problem solving skills. All right, so what we'll say is, if you take math, then you will have strong problem solving skills. If you have strong problem solving skills, then you will excel in any career. Hmm, okay. Therefore, if you take math, you will excel in any career. This is a valid argument. Well, a little bit pretentious. This is a valid argument, and this follows the law of syllogism. For whatever reason, I have this sneaky suspicion that the person who says this type of thing is somebody who's good at math. That's just my theory. Now, logical fallacies in common language, that's gonna be in the next video. Uh, we are not gonna cross that bridge right now.